Good morning, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly. This morning, I have with me the wonderful Stephanie Audrey. I cannot wait for you guys to find out a little bit more about who Stephanie is. Uh, and so I'm getting ready to read a little bit of her bio to you. And then, of course, we'll actually have to talk about a little bit more because this sister has done quite a bit. So Dr. Stephanie Audrey is the CEO and president of Blue Diamond Group Incorporated, including Blue Diamond Advisory, Blue Diamond Capital, and Blue Diamond Properties. As an entrepreneur, she has, she has maintained impeccable market vision and has conceptualized and launched multiple business ventures. Her entrepreneurial and corporate experience have covered multiple industries, including real estate finance, construction and development, consumer goods, entertainment, music, film, and television, high tech, financial service, insurance, multi, multi what is this? <laughs> Municipalities and more. I mean, she's got so much and wait until we get to this next part. You think she's done quite a bit in business. Wait until you hear all the different degrees she has. Dr. Audrey is studying for a Juris Doctor Law degree she holds a Doctor of Business Administration degree with a concentration in international business, a Master's of Arts degree from Antioch University, McGregor School of Business, focusing on organizational management and leadership. A certificate from University of California in Real Estate, Finance and Development, a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Antioch University, Upper Division coursework in International Finance and Management, Golden Gate University. Audrey is also Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certified and a project management professional. Dr. Audrey's dissertation, Venture Capital for Independent Filmmakers is being converted into a workshop training series. Okay, let me take a breath after all of that. Just let me take a deep breath because that was quite a bit. You see, I was fumbling over some of it because it was like, you have got to be kidding me. So I can't wait to kind of delve into this a little bit more. And so today's topic, you guys, is going to be on women and money and why and how to harness it. But before we get into that, I want to just kind of talk to Stephanie, because she and I go back a long, long way. And Stephanie, tell them, how did we meet? I'm sure that you we remember. Met. I do, Kelly, I do. I was the promotions director for KDIA radio station across the Bay, as well as building my business. Uh, one of my good friends, and I would say mentor at the time and colleague, Mark Wilder, knew that I was working on my company at that time, Ardry Associates International. And they, KDIA had been a community radio station, but it had been sold and turned into a news station. And the community had such an outcry that they convinced the original owners to buy it back and put the station back on the air. But at the time that the station came back on the air, the ratings were zero. And you know, ratings is how you attract advertisers. So it was definitely a project that required some quick repositioning. And so I came in under contract as the promotions director and started presenting KDIA to my corporate clients and doing cross promotions. In fact, one of my successful promotions, I had many, but one of the big ones was that we created the Hits and Memories Happy Hour at the Hyatt because the Hyatt originally as the Hyatt Convention Center in Oakland, and that was one of my clients. So I was just putting my clients together and making it all work. And so that opportunity, uh, Alita Carpenter was the general manager, and she was going to attend this gala, and she couldn't attend, so she sent me in her place. And so I came, and I remember being seated at the table, and it had been tough sometimes as a young you know, single woman, you go to some of these events and usually you see couples and sometimes the couples are a little standoffish, especially the women, because they don't want their husbands talking to that stray woman at, at the table. But I sat down and I was a little tentative and then you're beautiful. Hi, well, who are you? You know, you were just immediately engaging, introduced, you took over and introduced me to everybody at the table. And you were like, no, you're part of this table. You're part of this conversation. So I had a delightful time and I instantly fell in love and said, you know, she's a keeper. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so that's that how so, it started. That was a long, long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah. The Lord knows yeah. we've done so many other things in between all of that time. So yes. So this is awesome to be able to sit here and talk to you and find out some of the things that you're doing. And right now you are in Jamaica. Am I correct? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. I'm in St. Thomas in the St. Thomas Parish. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. And, and we'll talk uh, about that. Uh, some fascinating things. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I can't wait to find out a little bit more about that. So let's get into our topic. So we're going to talk about women and money, why and how to harness it. So um, I know that you were, you had talked to me a little bit about the science of getting rich by uh, Wallace Waddles. And yes. I know yeah. that um, I've actually read his books and I know you have to think in a certain, you have to do things in a certain way. So I hope yes. that you'll be able to talk about that a little bit more, but welcome. And let's talk about um, your illustrious career. So I want you to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you've done in your career this wasn't highlighted in your the bio that I read. Well, it's a very interesting thing because I say my career started, it felt like it took a turn before it could get started. And I say that because truthfully, as a young person, I thought that I was going to become a plastic surgeon. So it but but I played business. I, I was I was truly an entrepreneur, you know, being an only child, I had my, my parents were young. So as my mother was beginning her career, it was almost like I was sort of learning and growing with her like we were partner we're in a partnership. So okay. what I didn't even realize, which is so fascinating is that she started her career right out of high school as a commercial broker. I didn't know that I didn't know she had gone into commercial real estate, but she was following her uncle. And so she would travel from the Bay Area to Los Angeles quite a bit. And I think the toll of the traveling and with me being so young, you know, she decided to shift and then she shifted her focus into residential real estate. And along the way, she had tried a few things like Mary Kay and different things. And I guess me seeing her different business, I was excited about the forms. So okay. any of the leftover okay. forms I would use to play business, you know, but school wise, because we had a strong background in math and science, I was preparing to go to UC Berkeley and to become a plastic surgeon. And so I, once I learned about that possibility, I had been accepted in the GATE program, the Gifted and Talented Education program in the fourth grade. And so at that point was when I started taking classes periodically at UC Berkeley. I grew up in Northern California. so. Emeryville, okay. Oakland area. So spent a lot of time in Berkeley during my formative years. Um, and so that was kind of the beginning. But once I hit 10th grade, my mother was having challenges financially. And she also had become disillusioned by earning her own degree and finding herself being in situations where they would tell her that they couldn't hire her because she was overqualified because she had a bachelor's degree. So that was so disheartening for her that she didn't want to see me spend all these years to earn a medical degree and encounter a similar outcome. So mm -hmm. we struck a deal in 10th grade when she said, I just can't see you go to med school right now. And so I said, well, at least since I spent all this time preparing for Berkeley and let me get a two year degree. If, if I can get that, then I will one, be able to at least make more money and I'll get the rest of my education on my own dime. I'll figure out how to fit, fit it in, right? So who would have thunk it that that meant that I would still become a doctor at this point, working on two doctor, like, wow, in my yeah, wildest exactly. dreams, I don't know that. <laughs> like you made up for lost time for sure. My goodness, two doctorates, girl. Two doctorates, right. So, okay. you know, but that's kind of how it began. And, and then just adapting, I think, after making the declaration about my desire to be an entrepreneur and that, was a okay. that I saw at nine years old so it's just kind okay. of interesting well, yeah. yeah yeah absolutely very focused and that's one thing that I've known about you through all the years through all the things that you've done you've always been in school I don't think I've ever known you not to be but the focus is always there and that is 
phenomenal. That's something that most of us can't do. Um, so now talk to me briefly about the women and money and what we need to know. What is it that you want us to know? I want women to recognize their power because truthfully, women have been controlling the financial concerns for many of their families, whether they be the head of household or they be the, the wife, the spouse. Oftentimes, the woman has been the decision maker, the CEO of the household and making therefore all of the decisions about how the resources are allocated and that's literally the same mindset that you need when you're preparing to run a business because the CEO's job is to set the vision for the organization and then identify the resources that are necessary to accomplish that vision, be they human resources, be they technology logical resources, material resources, you know, whatever those resources are, those mm -hmm. oftentimes when you look at it, when you talk about the purchasing power of women, women have been controlling the checkbook, whether it was theirs or the combined checkbook of their and their spouses, right? And so it's interesting though, when you think about women in business, because for such a long time, women have shrunk when it comes to stepping out into the business world and they would pick businesses that were smaller or they would undercapitalize those businesses or they would say that it's just going to be a small business and they would never prepare for that business to grow and then when the market opportunity came where you could grow that business they had to play catch up because they hadn't cultivated the business relationships that are necessary. And so when I talk to entrepreneurs, I kind of sum it up in, if you will, kind of these three big buckets. Obviously there's detail behind the buckets, but it's an easier conversation if I say, we're gonna need to talk about your capital, we're gonna need to address the capacity, and we're gonna make sure we address the customers. And obviously in those three buckets, there's a lot of details involved but if we kind of step back and look at holistically what we're trying to accomplish is we need to make sure that we have the right capital that's necessary because that's the fuel for your business and if you don't think about the need for it then chances are when you finally realize that you need it there's too big of a gap to make up building those relationships and so oftentimes so how, you miss but how do they but how do they go about finding the capital? So it's about relationships, Kelly. It's like you and I, we did, a lot of times people go into situations thinking very transactional. What can you do for me right at this moment? And if you can't do anything for me right at this moment, you disregard the relationship. But there are sayings, you need to build your well before you need to go and capture the water so that you're prepared when the rainfall comes, right? If you wait until it starts raining to then decide to go and build your well, you're gonna miss most of the rainfall. And it's yeah. the same thing with capital and you need to have multiple relationships. So what I tell people is when you're thinking about a particular business, you wanna look at who are the category leaders in your space? So you begin to set that vision of where you see your business going. Are you building a lifestyle business where basically you create a job for yourself and maybe a couple of other people? Or are you creating a company that has the potential to grow and scale and become the wealth creating tool for your family, for your legacy? And so depending upon that particular desire, then that informs how you capitalize your business. So for example, if I'm a private practitioner, if I'm a physician, those are typically considered lifestyle businesses because I have to earn the license to practice medicine. So if right. I had a kid and my kid did not earn the ability to earn a medical license, then I couldn't pass on that business to the kid, but I could potentially sell that practice to another physician for the value of the customers that I've cultivated in over the years of cultivating and creating that business if I set it up for that. But that would inform how I finance it. I would wanna use more debt initially 
to finance the business as opposed to going out for equity. Because I would understand that if I'm asking for equity, equity is looking for a bigger play. So if I was then joining, say, three other physicians and we were going to build a practice that was going to, say, serve the state of California, now we begin to talk about a size and scale that becomes more interesting for a conversation with equity. But so equity, now where, yeah. Go ahead. Where do you find the women that you're talking to? And then the other thing, when you talk about building relationships, I guess I want you to think about the audience of women that are just really getting started, not the women that are kind of know a little bit about it, but women that are just thinking about it right now because we're in COVID and now people are thinking about starting business and what whatnot. And you're saying that they need to build relationships. So there was a time when we could go out and network with people based on different organizations and stuff. How are people able to build their relationships in a time like this? What do oh, you advise them to do? Absolutely. So there are several tools that I use. One, you want to get active on your social media, but you want to be active on your social media from a business perspective. So your LinkedIn, that is an amazing business platform. And if you set up your LinkedIn profile for business, you will find it invaluable in terms of the types of contacts. And so just in how you not only described yourself, if you looked at my LinkedIn, instead of me just having CEO, I use several specific keywords as my title. And that's because those keywords are searchable. Someone is doing a Google search on venture capital. Oftentimes, my name will pop up into their search. So they didn't have to already know me, but because of those keywords, then I mm -hmm. pop up. And people have literally found me because they're like, I was searching on Google for X, but you kept popping up. <laughs> Nice. It's like, who is, this who is this woman? Who is she? She's, who is this woman? And, and, and who is she? Because she keeps yeah. popping up on my feed and I don't know her. So I want to know her. Yes. You know, and so it's those kinds of things that, you know, begin to build those particular relationships. And it's not just about connecting. A lot of times people connect for popularity. It's connecting for content and shared understanding. Yeah. And so another way that I had started cultivating relationships is I used the platform Meetup. I set up my business profile on Meetup. And even though, you know, I'm from the Bay Area and was on the ground for Silicon Valley, I've been gone for many years. But when I moved back into venture capital, I wanted to still be connected to Silicon Valley and my Bay Area connections. So I started following the various venture groups, the various venture meetups that were happening both in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, in New York, in other key markets that I traveled to so that I'm aware of what's happening in those markets. So now I'm, I'm part of the community in those okay. markets. Right. And so I'm able to build relationships because I'm commenting, I'm doing things. I may not always be present. And sometimes you set up virtual events and that's where you begin to connect with these folks again. And so those things give you an opportunity to connect with those people and begin to build relationship. Because as with anything, think about this. If I walked up to you and you just met me at an event and I'm like, pitching you about my business and said, Kelly, I want you to invest $10,000 in me. You don't know me from Adam. Right. You're going to be like, lady, I'm not giving you my money. You may run off. Oh, I don't know what you're going to do with my money, <laughs> you know? And right. so right. oftentimes that's the first thing that investors will say. These people running up, giving me their pitch, begging me for their money. What they're going to get from me is some advice. Whereas if the entrepreneur was smart enough, to come to the, the investor, potential investor, and ask for advice, oftentimes in asking for advice, you begin the process of building the relationship. Right. And that's the relationship that ultimately ends up being your source of investment. Because when people know you and they begin to trust you and they begin to know what you're doing, then they become interested in being yes. a part of that. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly um, one of the things that I think that prevents people from 
expanding also is the, um, I, I think, you know, everybody doesn't have what you have. You have what I call this innate skill and that certain way of thinking, basically. It really goes back to that, doesn't it? It is. And you have to really, uh, you know, it, it's confidence. You got to really have the confidence and the know-how. You read a lot. You know where to navigate through this stuff. And when I think about, I guess because I've worked with a lot of women, um, because I'm a graduate of San Francisco Renaissance Entrepreneurship School myself. And so working with women that really don't know how to start. You, I think what you're saying is still kind of sounds advanced to me as okay. far as talking okay. to someone that's really trying to get started. So, okay. You know. Wait, you go, wait say that again, because you kind of went out on me. Think about your peer group. Okay. Who are the people within your peer group who are also thinking about business? And they don't have to be in the same sector that you are in, but they are thinking about business. And so what you want to begin to do, follow other people in business. You know, I spent a lot of time reading biography. So in the beginning, what I knew was I followed journal, Wall Street Business Journal. I read the local business journal because I wanted to read and know about business people. And so my practice has been each time I enter a sector, I start to look and see who are the authorities in that sector. So for example, when I wait Steph, you're going out again. You're going out. You hear me now? A little bit better. I think that wind is probably doing something to you. Okay, so let me see if I can hold my mic still and see if that helps. Can you hear me better okay. now? I can, yes. Okay, so I'll hold it and so it won't blow with the wind. <laughs> so when I thought about transitioning from advertising into real estate development, I remember telling people that I had been following some of the big developers because you would see their names in a newspaper. The newspaper is tracking who's doing what, so I started putting people in my phone, in my phone book, like I knew them before I ever knew them because I wanted to remember their names. And in the notes section of my contact, I would write what project they are associated with. And then I would use Google and I would create Google alerts so that anytime that person's name is in the news, the Google alert would update me so that I would know what that person is doing. Then yeah, if that but person- you know what, Let, girl, you're just smart. <laughs> I, just, just, I didn't mean to stop you, but it's just like that, that, that mind of yours, it just works beautifully. But I think what you're saying is so key, learn your industry, yes. learn who the players are. Yes. I mean, I, I, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, Beautiful. because somewhere along the, the the road, there was some there was a so I don't know where it came from, but someone told me very early in my career that the average person, the average so-called professional is not very well read. So yes. if you read all the books in a given year on a given topic, you will possibly become the expert because you will have taken in more of the content than your competitors. And thereby that would turn you into the expert. And then as a follow-up to that, there was someone that said something about I, I, uh, the 10,000 hours, that if you want to master a topic put in your 10,000 hours. And now I remember it was so funny. The night before my graduation with my doctorate is when I, 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 I didn't lay it on my family until the day of graduation that I had been accepted into law school and I was going on another journey. And they were just kind of shaking their heads. And I looked to my son and I said, okay, I'm back at zero, another 10,000 hours, you know, to mastery to feel like a master along this journey of earning a Juris Doctor. Yeah. The kind of mentality that I take for whatever it is that I pursue is one, a, a humbleness, an humbleness to know that I don't know everything that I need to know. Yes. 
and yeah, a desire you know you, you, yes, you know that I love to learn. I love <laughs> yes. to learn. Yes, you do. Yes, you are a reader, as is I'm, I'm also a reader. I love to read. Now, now tell me this. Let's talk about Richard Waddle a little bit. Why do you focus on that? So Wallace Waddle. Lord, I call the man Richard. I don't know where Richard came from, but I know his name is Wallace. Wallace <laughs> Waddle. Waddles, and you know, I can hear you. Say it again. Say it again. You went out. Wallace Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich. When I stumbled across that book, and it's a classic, the first yes. thing that I did was I looked to find out when the book was published. I was floored to believe that this book had been published in the 1800s. And when you read 1800s. it, it's like he's talking, talking to you right now. I'm like, 1800s. all of these principles yes. are relevant right now. But one of the main principles that he revealed that empowered me is I struggled as a young entrepreneur because you had mixed messages about the need to pursue a profitable business. So people used to say to me, oh, Stephanie, you're just so money driven. You just want money, money, money. And I kept thinking, I don't want the money for me. I see the money as a tool. If I have more money, then I can support more of my causes. I can hire people. I can help to change their lives. Like for me, money has always been a tool. And yeah. so finally, when I ran across Wallace Waddles, he really took the, the stance of admonishing people. How dare you not go and seek the resources necessary to develop the God-given talents that you have? That that is actually what's slothful. You, we're each given talents that need to be developed and you need to have the resources to develop the talents. Sure, you have raw innate abilities but they need to be cultivated. Well, you know, he actually says that you cannot really be living life if you're not rich. <laughs> <laughs> because says, everything requires resources. Exactly, so he really talks about that. And he talks about that there's no, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to, um, to be lucky. It's just doing things in a certain way. And it's really the way we think. And Absolutely. then putting that, not only the way you think, but also putting it into action. It goes along with the action. So, um, you know, yeah, you gotta act on true. your goals. So you, you think, and then you act on your goals to- Absolutely, to, to kind of absolutely, it it's so true. Yeah. Oh, you, go, oh, you went out on me. Yeah, I could hear you. I know I can hear you, but you just you freeze right, up right. every once okay. in a while. No just, worries, but that's no okay. Worries. We, you know, we know you in Jamaica, man. And right, so, exactly, okay. exactly. We're doing our best. <laughs> exactly, that's what we have to do. So, what I think yeah. that it's important for women to do, why that mindset shift was so, it, it really created a paradigm shift for me, and so mm -hmm. in that paradigm shift. What I stopped doing was I stopped second guessing myself, meaning, okay, I'm running towards the money, the resources versus no, maybe I should, you know, right, all right. that confusion in my mind. And then I could set a clear intention. And once I mm -hmm. set the clear intention, then I could have clear manifestation. And so right, that's right. what I realized was the tool. And so for women in business, what I would say is, if you look at where you are at this moment beginning your business, that is not where you want to end up. That's just the start. So you have to find an example. That's where you look at why we create vision boards. You know, we look to find an example of what a completed, successful outcome might be. And again, that's personal to each individual. I sure, can't absolutely. tell you the type of outcome that you should have for your business. You that but what i can yeah. do is show you how to get to that outcome and so i always say that there's three conversations going on at a given point there is where you are at the particular moment there's where you want to go and then in the middle there's how you go about getting there and so what mm -hmm. i do when i'm consulting with clients is i solve the how I'm like, I don't need you to worry about the how. All I need you to tell me is, we know where you are. We're gonna establish where you are and we're gonna confirm where you wanna go. 
And with those two pieces of the puzzle, I'm gonna figure out the breadcrumbs necessary to drive you to that outcome. Okay, okay. Now tell me this, Stephanie, what are you working on now? Because I remember before you left, you were really excited about something where you're like, Kelly, I can't wait to tell you what I'm working on. So absolutely. So yeah, so I made it back to Jamaica when I was here last year, which really I just had gone home the middle of November. So, you know, we're only six weeks into this year. So that wasn't so long ago, but right. I was here for three months last year um, because I felt myself one, reconnecting, I got grounded and I started reconnecting with the source, that little spirit that had been the fire that helped me move from the Bay Area to LA by myself on my 25th birthday to expand my business. You know, it took all kind of courage against a bunch of naysayers. I had family member naysayers. I had colleagues who said it wouldn't work, you know, all of that. And it took a lot to find my way. And so I found myself at a similar place in life where I always wanted to have an international business, hence the doctorate in international business, hence the early work in international business. Every committee, when I was part of the Oakland Chamber, I'm on the international committee. Like I've been sourcing international opportunities forever. In fact, my transition into real estate development, I wanted to buy an island and I wanted to be able to develop that island. You know, this has been a lifelong dream, but it seemed like it was in the future. This pandemic and stopping and looking around presented an opportunity for all of those things to be right now. So I came back to Jamaica to investigate further some business opportunities to see if I can package some of these opportunities and begin to raise capital. And one of the things that happens is that I was appointed as chairman of the board for a company called General Discovery Jamaica, which is a subsidiary of General Discovery Canada. Okay. And so in that role, what we, what we have been doing is putting together research and technologies that support the agricultural field by being able to bring new technologies and developments for the farmers because Jamaica is a land filled with rich resources, organic food, you know, natural foods that have been grown without any pesticides. And so as the world begins to request more and more organically grown produce and ingredients, they're here, they're ready to go. And Jamaica is uniquely positioned logistically to be able to not only distribute its goods in America, but to the continent of Africa, to the UK, you know, the, the, it, all of these distribution points are accessible from Jamaica. So it, it's a land filled with opportunity. And so it just, became real clear that sometimes you have to take your talents and go to a market where your talents are needed as well as appreciated and where you can make a difference. You know what, for some reason there's a blue line in you. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so that was, part, I don't know, it was something from the sun, I guess, but it actually was very pretty but there's this blue line going across your eyes and your face. So right, now tell me that's this. Better. So you are doing like a fundraiser for that, I saw. Yes, yes. When I got back, and it's so funny because back in October, I said I wanted to do a concert and I told Sterling, hey, we're bringing you to Jamaica. You're gonna headline a concert. And then the first set of folks that I had communicated back in October with, they, we, you know, they couldn't, they didn't follow up. I kept trying to, you know, go, yeah, I'm serious. And they just, I guess they didn't think I was serious. So they dropped off. I get here basically a week and a half ago. And this group is like, what do you mean? Yeah, we, we need a fundraiser. And then I'm like, well, we had already kind of talked about the last Saturday of February. So I called Sterling back and I said, hey, concert is on. <laughs> and so 420, and it was so funny because this company, 420 Wellness, I had created the whole brand of 420 Wellness a year ago 
without having a business to go under the brand. But I knew that the business was going to be the merging of holistic healing because of the research that I was getting around medical uses for cannabis. And it was going to also be about my ability to create these wellness spas where I can not only help you heal your body, your mental, physical, and spiritual self, but also help you to heal your business and help you strengthen your entrepreneurial ventures understand real estate and understand insurance and how using those tools together collectively you could create generational wealth for your family so it was a, the perfect marriage of the health and wellness and so when i met dr oliver we shared the vision and i remember him asking me hey i want us to create a company together and i said oh my god i already have the company and we just slept the business under the company and and we've taken off so the event on february 27th is called black in jamaica and it's a play on obviously black history month it's a play on getting your business to the black from the red um it's a play on sterling's song he has a song called black um, Sterling, his, as an artist, his name is Tin Colder, and he wrote a song called Black, and he's talking about, you know, buying the block back and, you know, investing and Black elegant, you know, excellence, and so it's a timely message, and he's being teamed up with local and international Jamaican reggae artists who have followings and who are already known in the industry. Uh, Jack Hutta is a Jamaican who happens to be out of Montreal, Canada. Literally, we passed by one another on the road yesterday and realized he had made it to Jamaica before Canada shut down their borders. So he's here. Sterling's on his way here. You know, it's Oh my like, goodness. This is gonna be awesome. I can't wait. How old is Sterling now? Sterling's a big old grown man. And I remember when he was a brand new baby. Absolutely. He just turned 24. Yes, we had the beautiful pillow that you made for him. Uh, <laughs> him. You know, wow. Memories. I, time. And so he's he's a rapper now, right? Yes, he's doing rap okay. music and he's producing and he's writing beats. He produced the music for my new show, Dr. Money Live, which will be coming out live. And so he's just really developing his artistry and taking it forward. And so that's really what I wanted him to be empowered to do. And so I love the fact that he transitioned from being in front of the camera and said, hey, I can be in front and behind the camera and I can build an entire media production company. And so I'm proud of him for seeing that path. And that's, I supported him because he was in college and he said, mommy, I'll be honest with you. You've taught me more about business over the entire he's like i've been in school i've been in school with you my entire life these Indeed. professors they're talking about some old stuff why should i sit up here and listen to them rehash some old stuff and you've already been given and i said you know what i'm a bet on you you can if you, you can always go back to college if you need to but being an artist requires endurance it requires hunger it requires some discipline and it requires a lot of diligence. So I said, I'm gonna support your artistry. So you go for it all in and go as far and fast as you can go. And then we'll see what happens after that. Now, I wanna ask you, who are three people that have inspired you? And just give me three. Okay, so I was first inspired by the late Reginald Lewis when I read his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Thankfully, that was so early in my career, but I read that book like I, he was talking to me. And when I look at some of the decisions about real estate development and investing and what, you know, I fought to be in this space that hasn't exactly been that welcome for women and definitely not black women, you know, it was because of that. I knew to business, finance and real estate. And I wanted to gain the expertise and knowledge. So he was number one. Okay. Um, Wait, you're going out again. What? I can't hear you. 
Yeah, I hear a ring. I'm trying to see where that's coming from. Is that you ringing? It's like it's coming to my computer. That blue oh, light yeah. is back in your face too. Okay. Pause okay. That. Okay, it's out. Okay. So anyway, the late Reginald Six. Lewis. Okay, so Reginald Lewis. Yes. In the Bay Area, when I was first starting off in advertising, Carol Williams. And Carol was just such an amazing inspiration because Carol is the woman that created the slogan for secret, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. So when I got to meet Carol, Carol was like legend, you know, she's a rock star of advertising. And to be able to have, and she's just a fabulous lady and fabulous life, you know, her husband, um, a top surgeon and just, she was just so interesting and just a creative genius, you know, so being able to be inspired and connected to her and her creativity and to have her mentorship. And then there was another person that was very instrumental, Al Gilbert. I met Al Gilbert when I was part of the Oakland Youth Corporation that later become Youth Entrepreneurial Services. Al is this dynamic brother. He and his wife had created a business in Sausalito that was called Wet Dreams back in the day. And they sold all these cute, you know, personal items. And unfortunately, when the big earthquake hit in the Bay Area, they had just expanded and added a second location in San Francisco. But remember when the bridge went down and all of that construction, oh, yes, all of that yes. stuff, yes, impacted their business. But I remember Al advising me and coaching me. He was the one that explained to me when I attempted to expand my business from the Bay Area, because I didn't move my business, I expanded, I was adding a second location. And he said, Stephanie, when you go to expand your business, you risk your initial business because something in the expansion can go wrong and it can derail everything that you've built. So you want to keep that in mind. And so thankfully him just giving me those tools and over the years, he's continued to be a mentor and a supporter. I still call upon Al, I'm looking for this particular opportunity, what do you think? And he always offers his ear, both he and his wife, Karen, they always have an opportunity to take a, a, a here. And you know, I can go on and on and on because I can say that I have had a number of people that I've learned from either directly or indirectly, vicariously through their published work. Well, that's why I asked for three, because I know that it can go on and on. And I actually know Al and Karen. Yes. I've actually done work with Karen over in, um, uh, what's the name of that community organization? God, it's been so long ago, but yes, really good people. Now, the other thing I wanted to say, so that was Reginald Lewis, Carol, Carol Williams, Williams, and, and then Al, Al Gilbert. Gilbert. Yes. Very powerful people that have been instrumental in, in your guidance. And that's the importance of having mentors. Mentors are so important to have. It is. No matter how big you get, how small you are, you got to have a mentor, somebody that you can call upon to help you work through some of your, your, your life business decisions. So now tell me this, looking back on your life, what would the little nine-year-old girl say to Stephanie, the grown woman right now? The little nine-year-old girl will say that manifestations, visions are powerful and don't second guess the vision. That visions manifest through your connection with the almighty and the ancestors. And if you are blessed enough to recognize the assignment that they have bestowed upon you, embrace it because it really is your assignment and the other people around you may not understand don't spend time don't i i hate that there are points where i wasted a little bit of time second guessing i wish that i didn't have those gaps in progress that i kept going instead of stopping yes yes yes, yes. Yeah. You know what? But we all have that. But that's part of the life life lessons. That's, you know, you, you learn from that, right? Yes. So no regrets. 
So now tell me this, Stephanie, before we leave, will you please give me five simple tips that uh, on how women can harness and grow their money? And then how can they be in touch with you? And then tell, let us know how we can support your, your fundraiser. Absolutely. About women harnessing their money. One, I want you to keep track of your money. So on, I'm on a show called Money and Mindset. Money and Mindset with the dogs. Wait, wait hold, hold for a second because you're going out and I want to make sure that they get this. Okay. And that, that little sun blue streak is in your face again. So move okay. over. How about that? go away okay yes no it's well yeah well no it's there. coming back okay that's good right here nope it's back okay. again let's see well you know what let's not worry about it no because okay. okay now okay well it came back <laughs> oh, uh, perfect I every time i say it. perfect it comes back <laughs> just, just kind of distracting so i want to be able to see that pretty face of yours without the distraction okay um, Oh, I see. So maybe turn a little bit to your. How about that? Yes, yes. Turn a little yes. bit. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Yeah, because I want to make sure that we can hear you when you say this. So the five simple tips yes. on how so women you, can harness wanna, and grow their money. Yes. Set some money aside every week. Use it as an idea of investing in yourself. We started with money and mindset, this idea of putting as little as $9 a week and then increasing it each week by $9, right? So if you start off with one with $9, the next week is 18 and you know each week you, you double it or you add nine, depending upon which one you're able to do. And then what I decided was we were doing it visually where we were putting the funds so that we, we could show and after week two, I told Theon, I'm not putting my money in a jar. My money needs to make me some money. I'm putting my money in my Robin Hood account so I could be invested. <laughs> I said, I'm going to put mine in the Robin Hood account each week so I can make some strategic investments. We're going to win, win, and win, you know, with this money. But definitely keeping track of your resources. Number two, if it's okay, Kelly, can I be truthful on this number two one? Okay, yes, you can. If it's on your ass, it is not an asset. <laughs> if, it's, if it's on your ass, it is not an asset. So stop. It took me a minute to figure out what you were saying. Okay. Stop, I'm like, what? Stop wasting money on things that are not going to deliver a return. Stop it. Stop it and stop it. If you own the company, that's different. So, or if you own in shares in the company, that's different. So if you have some stock in Louis Vuitton, okay, I guess I can understand you having some Louis Vuitton, you know, but don't just be out here wilding out, wasting your resources and making everyone else rich. That is a mistake. And African-American, the African-American consumer market has been guilty oftentimes of sowing our dollars into everyone else's possibility. And then when it comes time for our own, nobody wants to make that investment. Number yep. three, educate yourself so that you can become informed on investing. You have to think about this. You're either growing or you're dying. If you want to grow, you need to remain green and you need to constantly hunger for new information. You cannot stand still in this life. You will get run over. It's the same number four. Do not let your money sit idly in a bank account. Your money is depreciating in value. The bank accounts are not providing you with any type of interest or return. It's not even keeping up with inflation. So in essence, the longer your dollars sit there idly, you are losing money. And number five, don't be afraid to ask. Ask, seek, and find solutions to your questions. None of us are all knowing. Do not be afraid to ask. And do not be afraid to look for someone. And if somebody that you approach and you ask them and they turn you down, just move on, go next. 
<laughs> don't give up, go to the next person. Because when you want something so bad, you will not let anyone stop you from that outcome. You just keep moving forward and you'll get to Absolutely. the desired outcome. So you make up your mind that you're going to be a successful entrepreneur and that you're going to be the catalyst to start cultivating generational wealth in your family. You, one person, can change your family station in life. Your generational, you, you know, the great, great, greats and the great, great, greats. You, that one can be the one to change everyone's possibility. So don't Absolutely. be afraid. Do it. Absolutely. Those are beautiful. And don't forget to get the bag with Dr. Money. I have to always drop that one in there. <laughs> yeah, so but what I want you to go do, over. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Let me go over them and make sure that I have them ranked for you. You said one, set money aside each week. Keep track of, keep track of your money. Two, if it's on your ass, yes. it's not an asset. Three. Educate yourself to become informed on investing. Four, do not let money sit in, the, in your bank account. Five, don't be afraid to seek and find solutions to your problems. Absolutely. You froze on me. Are you with me? Absolutely. Yes, I am. Did you hear me? Yeah, you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes, I did. Did I yes, get I did. it? it did perfect. I get them right? You got them perfect. Yep. Yes. Spot on. Okay. So now tell me this, and then we're going to close out. Um, how can people be in touch with you? And then how can they support your fundraiser? Absolutely. So I'm going to send everybody the same place. It's 420wellnessjamaica.com. Number 420wellnessjamaica dot com and that's the same location that you go to to find out about the website about the events black in jamaica as well as the other activities so somebody really is trying to get me today eh <laughs> well i want to say thank you so much stephanie for being here it's been a pleasure and I know we'll have to circle back around at some point to kind of see how the event went and to find out how the fundraising is going. So we will definitely do this again, okay? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having me. And I, you know, I hope that these nuggets are helpful to your audience. But you know, the, the best thing I can tell them is to keep moving forward. Keep All moving right. forward. Because faith is about taking action. And don't sit and think that you have to have it all figured out before you take action. Take mm -hmm. action. And it'll start right. to show up as you take those steps forward. Dr. Money, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for listening to Straight Talking with Kelly. And I will definitely see you soon. Thank you. All righty.